Our next speaker is someone you can probably really thank for helping to re oops, that word doesn't sound work today. Um, refresh, reinvigorate the maker movement. In fact, he is the maker movement. So please welcome Dale Doherty. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yep. Thank yes. you, Wendy and Claire. It's nice to be here today uh, to talk to you about making. And uh, um, let me start. So I do Make Magazine and Maker Fair. How many of you have been to a Maker Fair? Good. We've got a number of you that have yet to do this. You have to put it on your bucket list at some point and, and do it. Um, so this may seem strange to you if you haven't been to a fair. Uh, and uh, I hope you'll, you'll go someday. So um, I'm going to say my talk is brought to you by the Roman god Janus, who is the, <laughs> the god of doorways and gateways and new beginnings. Um, in a sense, it's the idea of looking both ways at once, uh, the threshold. And, and I think uh, uh, it's a good way to explain, I think, some of the connections uh, around making. For instance, uh, most of us, see ourselves as users of technology. We don't see ourselves as makers of technology. Uh, technology has gotten easier to use and to some degree harder to build. Uh, but I hope in the course of this talk you will see that you can also be a user and, and be a maker and that lots of people are, are looking both ways at that. Makers are enthusiasts, and it was the one quality that I tried to identify, or I, I saw, and I just responded to it. Uh, they're people that love doing what they do. They're kind of hobbyists. They are passionate about something, and they will talk to you forever about it. They will uh, share it with other people. And these are people that might otherwise be rather shy about talking to other people. But you put a project entertaining and uh, engaging. So many of uh, I, I, what I like to think of became the maker movement really started by my meeting these people and saying, gosh, they're really interesting, exceptionally interesting people. Um, and we don't connect to them. We don't see them. We don't celebrate them enough. Um, they don't fit into our categories always of successful business person or academic superstar. Um, they, they are in this really interesting space almost between play and work. And my original idea around the magazine for Make was uh, about a kind of a return to play. That play gave us a sense of control over things. We get to make the decisions, we choose the colors, we determine what we want to do. Not a committee, not someone else, um, not the market. It's something we get to do and decide, and we create a space and, and a time for playing. Uh, and I think uh, play, in, in a certain way, especially for adults, has a lot of the intensity of work, but without a lot of the pressure. And so I was just interested in how making is both uh, something that we play at, and, and I also kind of saw it as like a precursor to innovation. Like play is, is when you don't really know why you're doing something or what you're gonna get out of that. You're just maybe taking something apart or you're figuring out what it can do and what you can do with it. And out of that, you begin to discover there are opportunities or there are things happening that, that you might respond to. But it's not as intentional usually as work is. It's like I have to have a goal or uh, I'm, I'm trying to do something specific. I call it kind of experimental play, especially among kids, as a way of, like, you don't really know if this is going to work, except by trying it. Um, and even if someone else got it to work, it doesn't mean that you'll be able to get it to work. So you immerse yourself in this form of play, and uh, it, it's, it's pretty good stuff. Um, I think it also embodies this idea of sort of creative risk-taking. 
of, of just doing something that you you might well fail at, and that's okay. It might be something that that uh, uh, in a sense the stakes are kind of low, and you can fail at it again and iterate and fail again, and then boom, something clicks. It also involves a kind of practical problem solving of just making things work and putting them together and figuring them out and just moving forward and, and not, um, uh, not being blocked by your own frustration or because things didn't work. See, it's not, not just, it's something you can overcome and, and you can find a way through. But I think one of the big interests in making today is, is what it, it's a form of personal expression. It is, when I think of making in the, say, Depression era, you know, it was a form of, uh, it was, you were being resourceful out of necessity. You were doing things that, that uh, allowed you uh, to do, you know, to, to have something that you couldn't buy. Today, I, I think it's, it's often more to make something to engage with other people. And we see this certainly at Maker Faire. It's to make them laugh or to have them to sort of even look at what you're doing and give you feedback. Here's where this all happens in the short clip of Maker Faire on the theme of play. At the heart of Maker Faire is this idea of play. We kind of get lost in it. flush it out, make it visible. Um, in some ways, it's a reinvention of the fair. The fair was something that comes out of England. People from remote farms get together and share pigs and pies. They, they share their work, they get together. But we don't really have that to bring to a fair today. And they're still fairs, but they're largely agricultural based. And so, but I think the same dynamic of sharing things that are from your backyard or your basement, your kitchen table, and, and getting feedback. But the real goal of Maker Faire is to help people understand that they can do things. And it's a pretty simple concept, I'll, I'll, I'll admit. But um, it, you know, uh, what I really thought was the magic of Maker Faire, and I think it's proven to be so, is that you see ordinary people doing interesting things. And that's accessible to you. you say, like, I want to do that. I want to make things. I want to be part of this community. So making is, is at once both a tradition, something that's been around and perhaps is, is so basic and fundamental to any culture. But in, in somewhere like America, it it's, is a tradition. But it's also a trend. And if I look back when I created the magazine, this is Popular Mechanics in 1944, but my Popular Mechanics, Popular Science really have their origins in the early 20th century. But when I read the articles in these magazines, they were inviting you to do things like build a birdhouse or a, a two-car garage. And they were all treated with the same <laughs> sense that this was possible. You could do it on a weekend. It was fun to do. Um, this is Popular Mechanics in the 60s, and these are two projects on the right-hand side that we've had in the magazine that kind of mirror a little bit. You know, we still put things on wheels. At the top, upper right-hand corner is, is, a, is a scooter powered by a, a power drill. And, um, um, but, you know, this, this sense, just reading the headlines, you know, the hazards of owning a home, but um, scientists on the brink of hell, I, I never really figured out what that issue is. <laughs> But make your own printed circuit boards is an identical kind of article we've had in, in Make Magazine. And the process actually hasn't changed in, 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 in 40 years or so. Uh, there are new ways of doing it, but the, that one process is something we've covered. 
But it, it sort of gets at uh, um, uh, this sort of development of even back then, this was you know, something you might do for your family as well as yourself. And I think what we have done is certainly um, refreshed uh, popular mechanics and popular science, but really put a new face on it, put a new way of understanding making, because today it's not, well, certainly when I started it, it was not popular. Popular science was popular. Popular mechanics was popular. Making is marginal. It's niche. It's tiny and small. And I didn't know when I published the magazine, though, that it would spark a kind of interest and resonate with people the way it did. <coughs> and in many ways, it was turning from away from the digital back to the physical. It is a kind of retro thing in our day and age to say, hey, we still live in physical space. We hold and touch physical things. We're physical beings. We are on a rush to being virtual. I've, you know, I've been involved with the web since uh, 91, and, and I get all of that. But I saw people working with things like robots and planes and, and things again. And the whole DIY world is largely um, not driven by digital tools, it's driven by physical ones. And physical media, not just digital media, and physical experiences, not just digital experiences. So I don't think it means that it's necessarily retro, I actually think it's the future, that we have to hold these things in some kind of balance and understand them. Now one of the, this is a, a, a desktop uh, at Georgia Tech of a student, and I think it shows you kind of the future of work in a way, of not only double the computers, but um, a 3D printer on the left is a little egg bot, a small CNC machine. We've got pliers and other hand tools around, a copy of Make Magazine. But, um, you know, we are designing and thinking on computers, but we're also expressing it through physical machines and building things. So, um, I think we are reacquainting ourselves with this sort of end-to-end -end production that it used to be, we're just going to design things and send it off to somewhere else where magically we'll get it back in two days. But we want it back in two minutes. We want to fix it and see what it looks like. And I, I have to believe, you know, this is some of the magic the kids see in, in 3D printing. I, it, it, it probably isn't the savior of education or anything like that, but it is so damn compelling, a 3D printer, to watch it work and it's like this, this sort of, it's like, you know, when you first saw electric typewriters, just, you know, de -de 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 -de, you know, things like that, that just, the mechanism is really interesting to watch, the noise it makes is, it, it's fascinating. But kids, I think, will begin to dream as though they had a 3D printer. They will dream as though they can make these things that only a 3D printer can make. Um, it has taken off. We did this last fall, a, a, a guide to 3D printers. Um, uh, you know, it's still relatively small. I wrote an article two weeks ago. Uh, there's probably only 100,000 personal 3D printers out there. There's industrial printers. And, and so, you know, is this, is this going to take off? I don't know. You know, I don't know if every household will have a 3D printer. Um, it probably won't be that simple. But these are becoming, uh, they're moving down, you know, just to give you an idea, what, uh, 2010, uh, MakerBot was really the first personal 3D printer, coming in at a couple thousand dollars. Well, the, the industrial ones were twenty to $25,000. Any of you that remember the laser printer back in Apple's days, you know, that was a twenty to $30,000 printer. Now, today, we all have $99 printers that we care less about, but that, 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 that laser printer, actually made Apple Computer because it brought a generation of creative people who never used computers onto computers because they could see what they could do with it. It made sense to them. And I think 3D printing is coming that way. So making is also about a process of making. And I think when you think of learning, it's probably more important that this is a creative process, a learning process, a technical process, an iterative process, than it is what we make. Um, 
It's also organized much, uh, I think the magazine has been this way, but I think this is the world of work, the future of work, is project-oriented. You know, you, and, and not just your own project, but collaborative projects. That you're defined by putting some set of things together, having goals, and iterating to it until it gets to some stage, or perhaps has, continues to have a life beyond. I'll give you a simple example, and I think this is our bread and butter of the maker movement, is, is how-to projects. How do you do something? How do you find something cool to do? Not like fix a toilet, you know, but how to put electroluminescent wire around your bicycle so it glows at night, right? That's pretty cool. You can't buy one of those, but you can make one of those. And here are the instructions. Here's the recipe for doing it. Now, you don't have to necessarily even build one of these to learn from this kind of instruction set. You might just be interested in using electroluminescent wire for something else like a, a lamp post or something in your garden. But we're explaining the technology, not just saying, here's something cool someone else did. We're writing it really in the sense of, of you know, gardening and cooking magazines. Here's something you get to do, not stuff that just cool chefs get to do or great gardeners, but this is something you can do. And I think particularly with kids, you know, you are building something that then you interact with other people. This is a, um, uh, oh, I just forgot the name of it. Um, it floats. No, a hovercraft. hovercraft. Yes, yeah. hovercraft. and uh, powered by a lawn, uh, uh, a, leaf you know, blower. leaf blower. And, uh, you know, so, you know, they take an old chair and they cut it out and they put some holes in it and, and it lifts. But it's, it's that sense that once, you know, I, I built something but I get to share it with other people and, and talk about it and say, oh, you did that. It's, it's fun. It's fun. <laughs> the other dimension I want to talk about a little bit is that I find awfully fascinating is uh, one between pro and amateur. The maker movement is really driven by amateurs and, and a real sense of what it means to be an amateur. Um, I was talking to someone about school teachers and they said, well, we need to do more professional development for teachers around making. I said, well, let's call it amateur development. <laughs> you know, because I want them to actually realize this isn't professional work. That part of the DIY thing is you can try stuff and do stuff. You don't have to be the best at it. It's still meaningful and valuable to be able to do it. If you want to learn welding, I mean, you could do welding for 20 years and not be as good as someone who does it professionally. But you could learn to weld. <laughs> and you could find it satisfying and even scary. <laughs> but what we're seeing also in the maker movement are you know, people like Jordi Munoz on our cover here who started um, uh, doing drones and, uh, in a community with Chris Anderson of Wired and they've gone off to form a company called 3D Robotics. But Chris happened to be the most active person in the DIY drones uh, uh, Jordy was the most active person in the DIY drones community. And Chris reached out to him and said, well, you know, there seemed to be a company in this space. We could start developing some products. And he knew nothing about Jordy. And he came to find out that Jordy grew up in Tijuana, um, left high school, and uh, began doing this. And Chris says, I would have thought that when I went out looking for the CEO of the next company, I would find an engineer from Stanford or Berkeley in the Bay Area. Instead, I find a 19-year-old kid from Tijuana who knows more about any of those things than anyone else in the world. Um, so you don't know uh, what the path is. This is another one that's actually kind of an alternate idea. These are two guys that work at NASA by day and, and did until recently. But they wrote an article for Make on how to build your own satellite for $8,000. That's something like NASA spends millions of dollars, but they're out finding off-the-shelf components to do it. They just spun off a company to, to now do that, to put the uh, uh, sort of off-the-shelf technology uh, uh, to build satellites and get them up in space. So things that you would not have dreamed of doing are being done by amateurs, and then they're finding ways to professionalize that. So one of the big uh, things that went, Maker Faire has grown, I, I didn't mention it, but we have about 110,000 in, in the Bay Area come to Maker Faire last year. Um, we're in our fourth, eighth year in the Bay Area, uh, we'll be on our fourth year in New York where we had about 55,000 last year. I think most of them seem to be families and young kids coming. 
And the kids are so excited and engaged. And what has always bothered me is I get them revved up. I get them, you know, to, to really interested in becoming makers. And they go back to school and it's not there. You know, they go back to their community and they don't find it. Their parents, if they're lucky, know how to support this, but many don't. And when you sort of start bringing making up to uh, the school systems, um, to be frank, they've forgotten it. It's been, it's, been, it's been lost. So you have to go back and find things to remind them. Um, what is learning? Uh, Bruner writes, deep immersion in the consequential activity. I saw the earlier talk talking about levels of immersion. But it is that sense of, of diving into something, having the opportunity to really develop a project, to iterate over a project, not having a 20 minute period to do an activity that it's all the same and you all end up with the same result. We've taken subjects like chemistry and made them the most boring in the world when they are in fact the most dangerous and interesting subjects possible. But we give kids checklists and they all have to perform the same task in a lab and get the same answer. So making, I think, is really about personal and social development. It isn't just about hands-on. It isn't just about physical. It isn't just about tools. It's what you do with those tools in the context in which you do that. So in many ways, it is a recipe for building the confidence in your own capabilities, discovering what you're good at and what you like, even what you're bad at and what you don't like and how to work through that. We talk about a kind of creative confidence, but you only get that by doing things and taking those risks rather than standing back and saying, well, I'm not creative or I'm not ready. In many ways, school is often about deferring the creative act until some point in, time in the future when you have enough credentials to do that or the right position to do that. But I'm telling you, if you don't do it now, you will lose it. There's also a mindset around making that I think is ultimately its greatest impact. Um, and these are just a, a group that I put together, kind of came up with some of these words, and there may be others. Uh, Carol Dweck has a book called um, Mindset that's uh, a Stanford psychologist, and she talks about, especially with kids, a, a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. And it's a, this fixed mindset, which is often uh, born by people who are very intelligent, very smart, very good in school, but they've been told what they were good at, and they believe that those are the parameters in which they must stay. Where a growth mindset is someone who will take a risk and say, I'll try that. Um, I don't know if I'm good at it, but I'll see if I am, if I like it. Uh, so making tends to be interdisciplinary across fields. It's, it is not um, so much a singular area. Interacting with people in the physical world. I, the physical stuff sort of gets obvious, but you know, honestly, most of the projects have to do with people. And in, in, in a funny way, if you, if, if you see that. This playfulness, I have imagined that, you know, having fun is core, sharing and participating in communities, and the sense that the world can be improved by what you do, that you have the power to change things and control things. And I think that underlies a lot of our fascination with technology, is how do we use it in these ways. You know, um, this is one of our young makers we sent to the White House last year, Joey Cutie from Arizona, and he participated in the, like the, world, the, like the National Science Fair uh, recognition at the White House. And you can kind of see the traditional Science Fair posters on the side that you know, talk about engineering design process and, there, and that. But Joey had an extreme marshmallow cannon. And the president walked by and said, does it work? And Joey says, of course it does. Now, the Secret Service told Joey that under no circumstance was he supposed to allow that marshmallow cannon to go off, but the president <laughs> overruled the Secret Service and he began pumping the, uh, the bicycle pump, put air in the cannon, and he shot it off across, and that's the president's expression as well. As <laughs> How far did he go? It really is price party. How far did the marshmallow oh, it, go? It went pretty far. It's a pretty good cannon. Uh, it went as far as it hit off the stateroom uh, 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 wall. Uh, there. So, you know, it, it made quite an impression. And as the president turned away, 
13-year-old Joey said, here's my business card. <laughs> Don't be bored to make something. <laughs> but Joey is a, is a wonder. Um, you know, uh, but I have to tell you a bit about Joey. Is he came to Maker Fair uh, the year before? That's how we met him. He didn't. Uh, he made stuff, but he didn't know anybody else in his community who did. And when he came to Maker Fair, he realized he wasn't alone. He didn't like school because kids made fun of him. He didn't. He came home from school and made things in his room. But through the course of Maker Fair, he began feeling it was normal to make stuff. And he could do that at school. In fact, he started a young makers club. And he began doing things. His mother says he never, he's a bit um, uh, somewhere on the autistic spectrum, that he didn't like to talk to people. But at Maker Fair, or when he's beside his project, you can't keep him from talking. So it brings out things in people that we don't often expect. Another dimension I want to mention is, is making is, at once on this sort of web, we can find it everywhere, but it's also intensely local. And partially because we belong these days to sort of uh, online communities, but it's very important for making to belong to local communities, to meet other people who are doing this and see them, just as Joey uh, did. Uh, this is a class uh, in my community. That, that I started to, to get um, high school kids to make things. But we have this notion of maker spaces, and some are being built in communities um, by geeks and called hacker spaces. And I wanted to make sure that maker spaces eventually end up in schools. And so we've, uh, we have a site, makerspace.com, and, and we have information there about what is a maker space and how to build one. In many ways, it's a revitalization of shop class and home ec and art studio, and computer lab. We can bring all these things together, but to create a place rather than a curriculum where kids get to do things. And we have a playbook, uh, so teachers and others who are asking how to do that can go online and just download that for free and get started. But I think of makerspaces as really a kind of on-ramp for the maker movement. It's where you build basic skills, you meet other people who are doing it, and, uh, and you make friends. You, make, you meet other people uh, who may work with you on projects. And this is a, a sample student project from that same makerspace I showed earlier. But you know, a kid thinking about, you know, he's gonna put a GPS in his shoes. So if you're out hiking and you're lost, you could follow lights on your shoes. Now, you know, who cares if that's a good project or not? <laughs> but it's a mashup of technologies and ideas and you begin to say, oh, I know GPS is in a car, I know it's on my phone, what about if I put it in boots? Um, and so kind of a, a, a kind of final dimension I, I talk about is a little bit about the spread of the maker movement, because I think there's something to learn from this, in particular that many of you are kind of involved in social change in, in various ways, especially education, is I don't really know how this has happened. You know, um, why has something like making uh, just sort of risen to the top? And why is it that people are so connected to it? And, and I'll, I'll give you some examples. But I kind of thought that our own method is a kind of scatter-gather approach, where we're scattering ideas out there through media and through examples and through events. And I don't know where they land or what happens. But when I see them develop, I try to gather them in. And, and, and highlight them and talk about them. Uh, it's not a centralized, but rather a distributed, a decentralized approach where I'm not trying to uh, uh, authorize or consult around makerspaces. I want people to just build them. And it's important that they do it and that I don't do it. And then in many ways, we're looking at how, how do we seed things, not how do we establish them. We need people to kind of take the DIY approach, like at a school. And you know, one of my models for makerspaces in schools is a school garden. How did that get established? It wasn't a federal bureaucracy that said we should all have school gardens. It was the independent actions of parents and others who, who showed up and said, you know that little piece of land back there? I want to use it to build a school garden. And nobody said no really loudly, because it was a little patch of land that nobody cared about. I think we can get makerspaces in the same way, 
saying that little closet or that little room or some other space is not being used. Can we use it for other purposes? Well, here's the growth of maker fairs around the world. It's so maker fair, in addition to the two that I organize, we have kind of like a TEDx model for many maker fairs. And there are 56 of those uh, last year. There were three kind of medium-sized fairs and two large ones. And we expect over 100 or so uh, this year. Um, but it has you know, spread around the world with people creating their own maker fair. And I think, I guess one of the things that you may not uh, uh, see in making and, and in the events, it's really about community organizing. It really is finding those makers uh, who are in your community. It's not about taking like a circus and bringing it from city to city. It's like finding that talent in your own community and try to grow it and connect it together. Because those makers then become resources to each other. They become resources to organizations like schools and museums. And, you know, as a part of this, we begin to see what I was talking about earlier, maker spaces begin populating those communities as well. Either, you know, a group of hackers forming a maker space or a children's museum or a science center getting together and opening a space. Um, we need a lot more spaces, but um, this Maker Fair has been sort of the catalyst for bringing the community together. I want to give you an idea of what one of these small ones, I went to one last Saturday and just took some pictures I thought I'd throw in, in here with you. This is uh, in Sonoma County where I live, but you know, this is, uh, this is a high school exhibit uh, from Pioneer High School and they, you know, say, uh, you know, they put a sign up and they put some of the projects. And this is a, a teacher that last year um, started a maker class at the high school and he has been building some of these planes. And he says, you know, the first time they build a plane, it, it doesn't fly at all. The second time, it flies, but not very well. But the third time, they've got a plane that really flies. And, you know, that process of going through something and learning how to do it, um, cutting pieces, he even mentioned over this balsa wood or, or whatever kind of wood it is frame they put just plastic wrap and he says you know it's kind of a, a membrane he says, you know I teach biology in my other classes when I say that you know a cell has a membrane they don't know what I'm talking about you know and they don't have the vocabulary sometimes of the physical world to relate to understanding things they can't see this is a young girl getting uh, an LED badge or pin um, LEDs, blinky LEDs, this is a battery and an LED. Um, it's kind of like the gateway drug to making. It's just <laughs> get them at any age to see, uh, see what it is to light a light. Building cardboard forts. How old is that? How simple is that? But it's still fun. Kids like to do that. And it's unstructured. Nobody's telling them how to build the fort. They're also taking LEDs and plunking them into forts so that they have lighting. Um, this is one, uh, you know, when I saw this, I kind of thought, uh, so there's a bucket of water, there's, that's wool, colored wool, and there, it's a felting project. They're putting in a baggie, adding the water, and then you kind of press it out, and you create, um, and it dries. It's a very simple project, but fascinating, and kids love to do it. And I, I started seeing the things around this fair, and I thought, do we live in an age where there's almost like a, a tactile deficit, where kids have not? You know, they're not touching real things. The sensations on the hand are, are new to them. Um, it's, it's almost like risky putting your hand in water. Uh, what could be in there? So here's another one. This is a, maybe an extreme example. On the other side, this was a take-apart station. Take, you know, taking apart old uh, laptops. If you're wondering what to do with your old technology as much as it might <laughs> you know, hurt your pride, let your kids whack on it like they do in this video here. <laughs> drums across from each other. Was, you know, you walk in the room and all you hear is this banging, and boy, were they engaged in that. Um, this was a, an old fellow who had a hundred-year-old rope-making machine, and was showing how to make rope from just twine. Um, fascinating, and you know, you walked away with a, a little string uh, of rope. Uh, rocket launching, um, 
these are uh, compressed air rocket, make paper rockets, you can make them all day long, and they actually go up really high, and it was windy, it was blowing it over on the roof of the thing, that's why people are walking to go fetch their rocket. And then this one is an example I just kind of want to leave you with. It was brilliant. It's, I walk in these Baker Fair and see, I see something I've never seen before. And beautiful, replicated by anyone in this room. This man was teaching kids how to make their own hula hoops. And he had a very simple process. He, first of all, said, how tall are you? And he took a measuring tape and he measured their height. And he said, well, we're going to build a hula hoop that's about twice your height. So then he stretches out this tubing, which is irrigation tubing. And he takes it, you know, to that level, and he has the kid, you know, mark it. And then down at the bottom, he has a miter and a saw. Um, so they cut the tubing. But actually, before they do that, he, they kind of test the length and see if it's going to fit. They make any last minute adjustments on it. But you know, the little girls down there cutting the cutting the tube. And then he he came up with these little bamboo connectors which are, you put into the two ends of the tube, and then on the back table it was duct tape, and you just wrap it around, and there's all kinds of colorful duct tape. But making your own hula hoop, and going out and playing with that. I mean, in many ways, the perfect make project is when you build something that <clears throat> causes you to interact and play with other people. And, and it's, it was a really simple, beautiful project. Um, and just a, a couple things. I started last year a nonprofit called Maker Education Initiative, makered.org, and really to try to, um, I, I don't know, you know, one hand to advocate that this ought to be in every kid's lives, not just suburban kids, not just kids who have families that know how to do this, that this ought to be in schools or after schools, but it needs to be, be there. And that every kid has this opportunity to be a maker, not just some of us. We started a program this summer um, called Maker Corps, where we're recruiting college-age students during the summer and to deploy them uh, into, uh, we have 35 host sites like science centers and other places which are going to do maker, like maker camps and maker programs during the summer. And these kids are really the near-peer mentors uh, for that program. So we had 335 um, students apply for 100 positions, and we'll be in 35 different locations around the country. So um, just to leave you with a, a brief sense of what, you know, I think of the maker movement as this sort of participatory culture, um, which, which, you know, things like Burning Man and others are part of. You do stuff and you create stuff. But I'm really trying to invite and inspire people to participate, um, to identify themselves as makers. Not, not that they can't also be other things. Maker is a fairly fluid term, but mostly to engage in their community. So lastly, to, for you folks that are in business, I would say that, you know, I, I would really want you to think about how do you see your customers, not just as users, but how do you see them as makers? How do you see them, um, let me skip that. Um, and this is Nike. And this is their message about, it was actually one of their original ad campaigns, is to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And if you have, you, if you have a body, you are an athlete. And I thought it was a really brilliant way of defining a whole new um, category. Um, and, and most people say, hey, I'm not an athlete. But you no, know, you are. And I, I feel that way about making, that everybody, whether you had the experiences growing up or are going to start them now, that you can be a maker and you can, that all of us really are makers. Um, and I think it gets to this idea of who creates value in society. It isn't just companies, it's all of us. And to really, I think successful companies help their customers become producers and create value, so something they can share with other people uh, through their social networks and, and elsewhere. Finally, uh, this quote, I think, does a best job of, of getting across what the maker movement might be about, ultimately. Um, I found it on a school board, bulletin board in Sacramento, and I didn't recognize it. But the key part is, is everything around you that you call life was made up by people who are no smarter than you. And I thought if we could get that message out to every kid, it isn't just a few people that get to create things. You can do it. Anybody know who said that? Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. And in many ways, they, they were at a, a movement of their own, which you could tie to the maker movement, going to the homebrew computer club, which was like a maker space. Meeting other people, sharing designs, doing it, 
because I was willing to do that for free for the rest of my life because he just loved doing it. But I just like to show you, that's what they started with. <laughs> that phone that's in your pocket started here. You know, and it took 40 years to get to that phone. But this is the crude beginning, a hand-carved Apple computer. Uh, you know, borrowed pieces. It's sort of meant to look like something, um, but it is obviously handmade and, and, and rough. Uh, that's what you'll see with kids. That's what you'll see with makers. But um, they will get much better. Thank you very much. Job. And what they did is they featured largely students who, were, who, who used, uh, they featured projects from students. Uh, some of them used their technology, obviously, but it was more about the students and their projects than it was about Microsoft. And, and I think uh, another way that I've seen, I don't know what Disney exactly did in New York, but uh, one time they were in the Bay Area, they brought their the team that builds theme parks. And it was almost like a team building exercise for them. They all showed up, and they set up some displays, but they talked about kids in the process of like, how do we build a new ride? And they had examples, and it was, you know, you weren't talking to a marketing person, you were talking to an engineer and other creative people that, that built stuff. So I, I think in many ways, sometimes when I talk to companies, they say, you know, ask what people do outside of work, and then have them bring that, <laughs> you know? And because it's actually the people in your organization uh, that, that I think are, are probably the, you know, the, that you want to put forward rather than just your products. Mm -hmm. We have another call, answer, uh, question? Question. Well, one. Yes. Right down here. Wait. Oh. Yeah. Oh. I also really love going to the Maker Fair in New York and um, <clears throat> Thank you, but also I wanted to ask you, you said that really the major movement was a community organizing movement, and when I think about the, um, the magazine, one of the things that kids seem to learn so much is just about the how-tos, and then how do they like, explain their ideas. Do you, like, with this summer thing, are the kids also going to be making their own things that they'll be explaining sure. other kids not yeah they'll be making things yes but yeah well I, there's a couple things i didn't put it in a topic one of the things i'd really like to see us have uh is is a kind of portfolio system uh or not, not some system but a way for and there are tools to do that and kids do share their stuff online but they don't curate it and control it in the way i'd like yeah. but um, that's something, I just started a working group under the Maker Education Initiative to bring some folks together like Mozilla and others to look at how do we, how do, we, how do kids share the work they do? Because I, 
I keep coming back to this idea that making creates evidence of learning and we have to help them kind of share that evidence and organize it and make it accessible. Yes, sir. Yeah, can you say a little bit more about when the maker mentality and activity comes up against schooling and school learning, you know, either in the schools or you know, something like those planes where you get a feel for the wing and you get a sense sort of intuitively, physically even of how it works, and then somebody calls it the Bernoulli principle. And you get all the formalism. Yeah. Is that a conflict? Is, is that, are there any issues in there to deal with? Well, there's a lot of issues to deal with. And I think, if I look at this historically, I think a lot of kids had more of this in their life growing up. So, in, say, a kid in the 50s, um, and when I read stories and, like biographies of engineers and scientists and stuff, they did this in their daily life. They had they were around tractors or, or their parents had worked in factories and they had a sense of that. Uh, uh, so that when they went to school, it kind of married theory and practice in, in a way that was useful. But today we just have theory and no practice and, and a kind of impatience with the amount of time it takes to do these things. I. I you know, find myself saying, hey, John Dewey, have you ever heard of him? Um, you know, uh, Montessori, and these people are 100 years old uh, or more, their, their educational philosophies and constructivists from MIT and others that really have made quite a compelling case for this, but it's completely ignored. Um, now, where I find that the schools are pretty receptive to making is when you start talking about how disengaged kids are, uh, just in, in particularly like in high school that we're not reaching them. I don't care what standards you put out, kids aren't, aren't connecting to them. They're not even caring to be scientists and technologists because it's, you haven't made it personal to them. It's some set of you know, extrinsic rewards. And, and I, I think my, my belief is that we're missing a lot of talent in, in schools because we're just, we have a sort of academic performer model for, for a lot of things. When, you know, if we, if we open the doors more to hands-on learning and, and lots of, you know, moving through this stuff on your own, you're going um, to make progress and you're going to believe that you can learn and, and you're going to be able to tackle new things. Uh, so, but it's, it's, uh, it's a challenge uh, today, I think. Uh, I feel like I don't, <laughs> I'd like to go into places where I get to argue with those people who are making the decisions about how schools are run today. Private schools are making these decisions and going and making. It's the public schools that, and, and sort of the national and, and state level bureaucracies, I think, that don't uh, have a handle on this. And, and part of it is they're driven by this notion of scale. And I would say that when they look at making, it, it's a, the way they would approach it would be a centralized model rather than sort of when I talk about the scatter and gather. It's like, can you just find ways of making it happen? School gardens happen without them. And I think making has to go the same way. If they try to do it, I think it will fail. I think, That's, wow, yeah. wow. Thank you. May 18th and 19th is our next Maker Fair, and then in New York in September, uh, middle of September. Sometimes I forget the dates. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.